Welcome to another figure week, hard surface week, organic week. Hey everyone, my name is Ahmed al -Douri. I'm a concept artist and former instructor at Art Center College of Design, Brainstorm, CCS, CGMA, and various other places. And I would like to introduce to you this digital painting course that I've created. But before we get into anything, I just want to thank you for the support you've all given me this whole time. And with the support of so many of you, I've been able to put together everything I know about painting into this digital painting course. You want to become a pro, illustrator, concept artist, or even just a hobbyist, but you don't have a clear map to get there. And that's where I come in. I spent the last six months compiling everything I know from my 20 years of art practice, and I've turned it all into a map. Starting with foundations such as rendering shapes, color theory, painting basic subjects, understanding brushwork, brush economy, all that fun stuff, deconstructing the skull, drawing it from every angle, all the way to master studies, stylized painting, and you'll find yourself at the end of the course doing a concept art project based on everything that we learn in the first 14 lessons. So how does it work? Well, you sign up, you watch the lectures, do the assignments, post them to the community page if you want, and treat it as a self-study, except for those of you who have signed up for the weekly meeting where I personally critique your work in a virtual classroom setting. I believe learning by repetition is super important. That's what I've sort of presented a lot in this course, and the assignments are tailored for that, as adapted from my time teaching at Art Center. And each of these lessons have step-by-step -step explanations in real time. If you've ever seen my videos, you know exactly how I teach. And this course is intended to be a substitute for a college-level course, but you don't have to pay the four or $5,000 per class, racking up maybe 200K in debt. With my custom design course, you'd be paying a fraction of that. And of course, I also have payment plan options if you don't want to pay for the whole thing at once. Thank you for watching this, and I'll see you soon. guys and uh, welcome back to another episode of the Jalark cast um, I'm glad that you guys have returned one more time I know it's really uh, last minute that I've put this episode out um, but the interview kind of happened last minute um, I was approached um, by our guest um, basically because they had a limited schedule and if I didn't speak to them kind of now it wasn't going to happen for a while so um, this is the reason that we're talking to Ian today um, I do give him a, a great intro and uh, have a great conversation with him. Um, a couple of things uh, that I want to start out with. Um, of course, usually I don't do a kind of housekeeping thing, but um, I want to just clear a few things up just now before we get started, because this might be my one and only episode for the year. So I want to um, just check in with you guys and, and let you know how I'm doing and what's the plan moving forward and, and, and uh, notes about the episode, all that kind of stuff. So firstly, um, I'm doing fine, you know, uh, I'm actually um, working on some stuff just now with uh, a company and I'm doing some work. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the update. I can't talk much about that just now. Um, but yeah, so doing that, uh, also try to take care of my health, um, try to get healthier as much as I can. Um, and of course, I couldn't have an episode this year without talking about 
my last video which was um you know technically it was uh the last two interviews i done but also i released a video saying that i was leaving youtube and taking a break um yeah so i just want to say thank you first of all to all the people who uh left really amazing comments who um you know left comments saying stuff like my podcast had got them through college or got them through school um it helped them find their first job it kept them sane during the pandemic um there was you know loads of comments on my last video and uh, apart from the ones of course that <laughs> were people getting recommended my video and they were like why the fuck am i getting recommended this video um the majority of them were really sweet and um yeah thanks for for just obviously you know um you guys you know i, I don't want to gush i don't want to get emotional but yeah like it it meant a lot to me to see that i was having such a positive impact on people's lives um it definitely fills me with joy makes me really happy that um you guys are happy and that you're finding some kind of reward from listening to my interviews um so thank you you know for, to everybody who left a comment to everybody who liked the video and to everybody who subscribed and listened to my podcast over the years um yeah it, it, it's been it's been a great honor to serve you guys and produce the podcast um also you'll probably hear towards the end of this episode but just in case you don't make it to the end um i will be in los angeles uh the end of this year um to attend lightbox uh in la so yeah if you guys are out there or you're going to be out there just let me know if you want to meet up um or you want to hang um i wish i had a bigger community on honestly because i could have maybe arranged like a meet up for a sketch up and stuff like that but you know um if you guys um are out in la and you see me don't be uh, afraid to, to come up and talk to me i know the last time i was there some people had met me and they were kind of like i was going to come and ask you for a photo or i was going to come ask you for like you know just to come and talk to you and stuff i didn't know if you were busy and it's fine you know just come up and chat to me i'm quite happy to talk to him who wants to be to talk to um i'm always somebody who will talk so don't worry about that um so the episode so yeah so this conversation with ian is probably unlike most you've heard this isn't really a conversation about how we get in an industry or what brush to use or you know like at this point i think ian's been asked those questions so many times um you know he says he doesn't mind answering them but i felt like it was an opportunity to speak to ian about stuff that he doesn't usually get to speak about um so we ranted about movies and comics and uh superheroes and, and many other things um so if you're looking for that type of episode where it's like how to break in the industry, how to work an ILM, or how to use certain brushes, how to do character design. It's less that, it's more a conversation about stories. It's what I would say is the best way to describe it. Um, and, uh, and, and also, um, I don't know if you guys noticed in the title, but this is technically, if we're talking about me interviewing a person, Ian is the hundredth person I've interviewed, officially. Um, I think it, it technically is 99 because uh, Colin, back in the day when he was helping me, done one of my interviews, uh, Matt Rhodes. So technically it's 99, but we'll call it 100 just to be, uh, just to fill up that, that, that void. But yeah, so Ian's my 100th episode, 100th interview. Um, and I couldn't think of a, a greater way um, to really, you know, fill out that, that round number. Um, so this is why this episode is really just titled A Conversation with Ian McKaig um, Because um, it really is just a conversation It's just two of us talking You know, we've been um, I don't want to say friends <laughs> We've been definitely talking on and off for years You know, so I am We've had many conversations But this was the first time we got to record it And it's just been a great pleasure To talk to Ian And, and delve into his creative mind And learn about how he sees the world um the audio also at one point for my video goes out of sync there was a technical issue there was nothing i could do to recover it um so if my mouth is moving and there's words coming out and, and out of sync just ignore it just keep looking at ian it's fine because he does most of the talking in this episode so um yeah um i hope you guys enjoy it and uh you're gonna kind of jump into a juxtaposition with the next clip but um yeah enjoy the episode um, if you guys have any comments or anything to add or anything you want to ask me, leave it in the comments below um, or just email me and uh, we can chat. But I hope you enjoy the episode and thank you again for the many years of listening to this podcast. Um, I will be back at one point 
Um, until then, enjoy the conversation with Ian. Um, but this interview that is now coming to your lovely ears and eyes um, was one that I couldn't pass up. Um, my guests and me had been talking back and forth for almost three years now, um, trying to organize a day to talk. <laughs> and of course, uh, the person is extremely busy, as you know. You've probably already seen the, the name on, on the episode, but um, I feel like I have to, to intro him uh, regardless, because I mean, at this point, I think if anybody deserves an intro on this show, it's definitely my next guest. Um, today's guest um, is it's truly an artist who really does need no introduction and um, but again like I said I'm going to give him one anyway um his accomplishments in the fields of art and design have been you know just too impressive not to share um he was born in Santa Monica a lot of people maybe don't know this but studied in Scotland where I'm from um so which is you know a great connection to, to what we're talking about um a man with the sync artwork and he's played a key role in some of the most beloved films in the recent decades, um, you know, a respected illustrator, concept artist, storyteller, director, writer, um, his talents brought to life some of the most cinematic and iconic characters in cinema history in the last couple of years. Um, you know, behind Star Wars, he's, he's worked on things like Darth Maul and Padme, Am Padme Amidala uh, in character design, and his works also graced the screens of movies like Terminator 2, Hook, Peter Pan, The Avengers, um, a very long stint at Industrial Light and Magic. Um, he's a dedicated educator, you know, he's been sharing his knowledge with the next generation of artists for many years. Um, he's an author with his book Shadowline, which is the art in McCake, which is obviously put out a while back, but, you know, you know explores his, his, his storytelling and his art also. Um, he's also recently been using his art to his awareness for important causes, being a bit of a philanthropist, philanthrop philanthrop I can never use that word, philanthropist. <laughs> Uh, listeners, today we are privileged to have an artist on who's left an incredible mark on the world of character design and film. Uh, please join me in welcoming the extraordinary Mr. Ian McKay to the show. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I had one lined up as well for that. There you go, Ian. <laughs> A fanfare waiting for you. Yeah, so. How are you doing, Ian? Awesome! After that, man, you can introduce me every morning. I'll get up. <laughs> I watched that. Uh, <laughs> I know. I watched a, a documentary one time, and it was about um, a Rolling Stones editor who had to uh, at South by Southwest. He had to introduce Morrissey, oh, and wow. he was like, "How do you introduce Mor Like after decades of work and songs, like how do you?" And so it's like on that scale, it is so high within the art industry of like how do you and uh, you know introduce Ian and make it worthwhile. So. You know, it's, yeah, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing when when you're at a, a party or something like that, and people always ask, "So, oh, so what do you do?" Yeah. I never <laughs> know how to answer that question because because really, draw. do you, right, right? Do you define yourself by your career, by what you yeah. do in your spare time? What did I do this morning? What do I like to mm -hmm. do? It's like there's no answer to that question. I mean, I would say for you in particular, storyteller is the most apt word I would use to describe sure, sure. what you I do. Love I love stories. Yeah. I think storytelling. I would be happy with that on my tombstone. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think when it comes to drawing, directing, writing, concept, I think it all is storytelling. It all yeah. boils down to that kind of one thing, which is telling a story. So, well, and, and especially when you draw characters. So, and so, so is life, right? Yes. If, when you're yes. when you're born, you kind of imagine for yourself what you're going to be like when you're growing up and uh what yeah. you're going to be doing and who your friends are going to be and you know what success looks like to you and you write that story for yourself yeah. and and i think that's partly why i i think it's important to learn story because every once in a while life comes along and something happens and it bumps us and it yeah. wasn't supposed to happen either an external event or something we did mm -hmm. and you're shaken because you remember wait i made all this up <laughs> I, none of this is secure and true. What am I going to do? And so you have to quickly yeah. rewrite your story so that it all makes sense again. And that's partly yes. what your dreams are for to help you rewrite it. So if you know how to write a good story, if you know what a hero is, you yeah. can write yourself a good life. Doesn't mean it'll happen, but it means you've got a, a path to follow, right? Yes. So I think it's important we all learn what stories are, and <laughs> what heroes yeah. are, and what villains are, and how not yeah. to be them, and you know all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I think it was Alan Watts who said um, the greatest superpower that, that humans have is storytelling. And I think oh. it's, it's very true. And I, I think, you know, one of the things, because th there's a whole thing behind the word cult, is it culture. And it's a thing where how do you define culture in a society? And it is the stories we tell because mythos that was created way back in the day, um, you know, it was there to basically pass on stories. 
Um, if you look to some of the, the, you know, like Little Red Riding Hood and Goldilocks, a lot of those stories are cautionary tales for children to not wander into the forest. Right. And uh, so we've used storytelling to to pass on, you know, um, warnings about, you know, not only culture within ourselves, but external to us and how sometimes hills would have names and stories behind them as well. And that's where we would remember them. And, yeah. uh, you know, some of the mythological stuff where like in Ireland, you know, for years that people had this theory that small white butterflies contained the, the souls of children. So you would never catch them or kill them because people thought that they were ancient and how fairies had small nests in flower beds because it would be that you wouldn't disturb the flower beds because there was fairies in them. So, yeah, storytelling is definitely something I think that we have a dichotomy on versus other animals in nature it's, and stuff like that. It's, it's one way to give meaning to things, right? Yes. Because you can fall into that rut where, well, it, it, nothing means anything, right? You don't yeah, yeah. take anything with you. You don't leave anything behind. Well, mm -hmm. but that's not true. You do. Yeah. Right. And, and the stories, yeah, that's how we pass it on. Yeah. But yeah, I love them a lot. But, but also, you know, I think it's really important to be a good human being as well. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, I do. I, I do. Yeah, and of course. I, my wife is the perfect person to remind me of that because she's like i can't impress her with a drawing at all she's just not interested <laughs> so i actually have to be a good human being around her i don't get any points so. yeah of course no yeah you think it would go without saying in most in most occasions but yeah it's something i think yeah most people no, don't draw, and... can't draw her a unicorn and, and you know impress her yeah exactly so i mean now you've kind of existed in the industry we talked about you know 40 plus years how you've had this whole career span and and um, I mean, looking back on it now, I mean, do you still, you know, do you still feel the weight of your name? Do you feel like that, you know, when people talk about using a do people still, you know, introduce you to parties and you still feel a bit like on this of people, you know, like, oh yeah, this legacy or this huge, massive, you know, does it, is it ever lost in you? Like the legacy you have behind you? Nah. Nah. <laughs> Not even a little bit. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that, um uh every every day it feels like a first date right right and uh and it's nice to get lifetime achievement awards but hey i'm just getting started <laughs> and and also you know i have so many uh forms of storytelling that i still want to yeah. do I'm, I'm working on my first set of short stories right now uh, it's a book right. that'll come out next year okay. um through titan titan books in britain right and um i've i've written a lot of screenplays, I think about 18 screenplays now, and I'm, I'm comfortable with that form. I know what I'm doing there. And yeah. I've written one novella, which was the, the story inside Shadowline. Right. Um, but, you know, short stories as, as a published form, that's a new thing for me. Mm -hmm. And it's always good to go back and remember what it's like to feel utterly overwhelmed and foolish and <laughs> like you'll never be able to do this. And then what the 43 years does for me is that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can go, yeah, that's how it's supposed to feel, you idiot. And then you put your hands in the air and you enjoy the roller coaster ride. And you don't worry that you don't know how to do it. You will know how to do it. You just keep yeah. doing it until you do. But yeah, I, mean, also like, find, I also find that there's a, like Ursula Le Guin has this great quote, there's no walls so high and impenetrable as the ones we build for ourselves. Yeah. So a lot of it is the way we've constructed our belief system around us it sometimes doesn't allow uh, a new thing to come in. You actually need to go back to your wall, knock it down, or build a door so you can actually access the other stuff. When I teach yeah. drawing, that's that's the biggest hurdle. Most people mm -hmm. build a sort of a system of symbols. Mm -hmm. So they don't really look at what's in front of them. You know, they, They'll cut a little piece of a, a body out and say, that's an eye. And then they put a poached egg there because that's the shape of an eye. No, it's not. <laughs> Eyes are light and shade, and you really can't tell where, if it's part of that light and shade yeah. behind you or here. And where do you actually cut it out? Yeah. So, you know, um, trying to get rid of symbols and just draw what's actually in front of you is a huge hurdle for most people. But yep. like like all things, six months, one hour a day, you can learn it. It's well, just, someone it's actually said, like yeah, there was, some, there was some weird statistic I read the other day where like, if you uh, spend 18 minutes per day for a whole year doing a hobby or doing something, uh, you would be, be, at the end of the year, you would be better than 95% of the people on the planet who do that hobby. <laughs> and 18 minutes essentially is nothing, you know. Um, so Yeah, I mean, for drawing, I call it the mile of paper. 
Yeah. You do have to put a mile of paper under your pencil before you actually start to get it. And I think it took me, it took me about 17 screenplays before I really got that and understood what I was doing there. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I'm sure, you know, my first short stories will, will be fine, but I'll look back on them yeah. fondly years from now and hope nobody ever reads them. <laughs> I need to send you, um, I need to send you a, a podcast I listen to called Blind Boy Podcast. And Blind Boy is someone who has written for TV and film for many years, but has also done multiple books of short stories. But his podcasts are some of the best ASMR I've ever heard because he's Irish his voice is so soft and gentle that listen to him is incredible but he talks about um short stories and writing in a very apt way and has wrote you know many many books so i'll have to pass it on but yeah he talked about just like the drawn sense of, of style writing's the same you need to get your ten thousand words out instead of your ten thousand drawings um but then you'd also directed um the short film the face but that was shortlisted for an academy award right yes yeah. i mean i mean was that how was that experience as well oh for for the film that i directed yeah, 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 of course. Well, but was, I mean, well, uh, people know you as the artist, right? right? And someone who's drawn, you know, the, the people, but yeah, now yeah, yeah, right yeah. inside of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the face was not nominated for an Academy Award, I, I wish. It, it won about nine awards at uh, different film festivals and stuff. Right, um, but still. Yeah. It's still. Yeah, some recognition, <laughs> you know. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't well, be the Academy, know. but yeah, yeah. The, the, the awards actually don't mean anything to me no either. of course no i, I understand I, um, yeah i i i know in in that kipling poem if you know he says if you can look at success and failure and and treat those two frauds the same or two imposters the same yeah and and it's it's not that um i don't appreciate mm -hmm. getting something like that yeah. but it i have a vision in my head of what i'm aiming at and yes. i know i'm always like so far people ask me what's the best thing you've ever done it's like with the next one yeah Right. Yeah. Because because you never quite get there and mm -hmm. and yet getting there, the reaching for it is such mm -hmm. a joy. Mm -hmm. Every time, every every failure is such a fantastic attempt. Yeah. Um so it, it just it keeps you going. Yes. Um but that's that's what I mean. The reward is the doing it. It's not right. necessarily whether it's the best film in the world or the best story in the world, the best picture in the world. Because that will right. change too, right? Yeah. Haven't you noticed that films that you loved as a kid and you watch them mm -hmm. now and you're kind of like <laughs> and, and and actually, maybe I'm wrong about my short stories. Maybe these first short stories I write will be the best thing I've ever done, right? Yeah. Because I've got 43 years of experience in other arts to bring to them. Um, yeah. You just don't know. But you yeah. never set off to write your second best thing or, you know, your best yeah. attempt at something. You, you sit you down. You try to make it the best. Yeah. yeah. And or you try to make it true. Yeah. Right? It's not whether it's the best or not doesn't matter. It matters yeah. whether it's honest and you're actually bearing a bit of your soul to the world and letting them share how you see things. I think that's mm. more important, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've got to be honest when you draw as well. I think it's, you talk about <laughs> that. Yeah. You can be honest in everything, my friend. It's funny when you, when you ask this morning, well, what do we talk about? It's like, well, no, everything. Because yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Just, we just talk. We're just your, but you, but you have to talk honestly. Yes. Right. I, I noticed that in your podcast, you're very good at, being yourself and actually just asking people things and not getting starstruck or anything like that with people. Yeah. Cause after a few minutes, it doesn't matter. We're both human beings. You're just, so. that's the, I mean, people talk about, I had an interview one time when people were interviewing me about, you know, cause the biggest accolades I've kind of had at my career at the moment is the podcast. So when I've had people have me on their shows, they talk about my podcast instead of my art, but people say that is what's the biggest thing you've learned. And it's like that artists are just people like us, you know, they're just people trying to get on with a job, and uh you know do the best they can every day and get up and make what they think is, is the best stuff they can make and be honest with ourselves and yeah i think when you knock down that wall of superstar or celebrity or lifetime achievement you know like we've had multiple conversations before this before we've interacted in this podcast and you know the, the thing we found about myself and ian is we're very similar in the way we look at the world and the way we want to leave it and, and the things that we think in our heads and the way we want to approach people uh and I think it is a thing that's lost when people, you know, come up to you in light box, they might have the whole, oh, Ian, you know, I'm, I'm not worthy and everything and that. And you're kind of like, oh, you know, you know, it's lovely to hear that people hold you in the high esteem, but then you're kind of just like, but I'm just a person like you, you know, I'm standing here in front of you, you know, in the room, just like you are, you know, sitting in the audience. It's, I'm no different from, you know, where you were, you know, I've just been here a bit longer, but I, I still do the same job as you. I still draw, I pick up a pencil, I sharpen it just the same way. What is it they say? You know, I put my pants on one leg at a time. So it's like, yeah, I sharpen my pencil. <laughs> just like you, you know. <laughs> so. Actually, I throw mine up in the air and stick my feet through. <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, that's right, why you're different. Everybody did. Jeez. <laughs> um, 
yeah so i mean so yeah it's, i think when you interview people and you do enough of them you do see it as trying to find the human element in the person and i do the less talk of you know because even when I have people come on who are more high you know highly regarded they get asked the same questions over and over again and it's always how did you start where did you go to school how did you get your first job and then when i try to find the human element of like well what does art mean to you or why do you pursue art you know like things the more philosophical stuff people are like ah oh, you know it's not this the usual yeah yeah you know, and, and yet at the same time we're also all different yes right no nobody will have your uh set of of loves and hates and likes and histories and and experiences all yep. rolled up together in one yep. um that's that's the one thing that ai doesn't have and knows it doesn't have and knows it will never have is that kind of physical experience and i shouldn't say never because you know life is always surprising so who knows what it will become but at at the moment it doesn't can't tap into that but that's what we have Mm -hmm. just by default and if you keep your eyes and ears open and try and have a really like really live that life Mm -hmm. right and try and take risks and be a good person you know um then i think you've got this wealth of stuff that's unique to you yeah and really all you have to do is get the craft to be able to show that clearly enough to the world Mm -hmm. that then you know you're as unique as any artist that's ever lived ever and really that's just divide those two things up work on your craft every day i do you know if i'm not doing a podcast and having some coffee Mm -hmm. in the morning i'm upstairs and i just draw for an hour and I do, I do my life drawing and I, I go outside and I sketch every single person I can find, mostly walking down the street these days with a sketchbook in my hand. Oh, nobody looks at you. Nobody poses or gets offended when you're walking and sketching because yeah, yeah. nobody can do that. Yeah, yeah. So you get some really great expressions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And once I'm, I've done that, I'm yeah. all sharp. Yeah. And now I can go and work, you know? Yeah, I, I had a, a revelation the other year when I was at Lightbox, well, 2019, but there was a guy there selling a thing called a sketch wallet, which is a wallet slash, well, a little sketchbook in it and a little pencil. So now everywhere I go, I've always got a, a sketchbook on me. So when I'm sitting in cafes, I draw people, yeah, you know, nice. eat, drink their coffee. So, um, yeah, yeah on, on, the, on the idea of like stories and being unique as well, I remember John Relson, that one of the guys who came over for Pixar one year to iMag in Paris, um, he gave me two great pieces of advice. Well, he gave the audience two great pieces of advice. And the first one was, work like you've already got the job, which I thought was great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the second one was, the stories that you have in your head, if you don't tell them, will die with you. Which yeah. I thought was very apt for people who well, want actually, to tell stories. Yeah. That's why the collection of short stories. So yeah. is it six years ago now, or I got six years ago, I actually had a heart attack and died. And um, they managed to pull me back. Wow. So no, it was an amazing experience. And, yeah. and it's a long story that involves Tom Hanks and a robot. So we might get around to that later. <laughs> okay. But... Um, the epiphany was when I came home from the hospital, mm-hmm. um, literally those cupboard doors there, if I open them, they're packed full of stories. Right. And no one's ever seen them. Right. Well, that's not true. I've, I've maybe shared them with my, my children. But, right. Uh, other than that, nobody's, nobody's read them and yeah. they, they do die with me. Yeah. And I thought, okay, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So what I did is I, a lot of them are novels and we're going to be big feature films and all the rest. And I thought, mm-hmm. no, I don't think so. How about if I just write the shortest possible version of those? Yeah. And lo and behold, a whole bunch of them are actually take place in the same place. I've written them over yeah. 20, 30 years, but it's a, it's a little town that's kind of a combination of the one I live in now and, and one I lived in over in America. Right. And so I just called it small town. And yeah. it's, it's, I don't know if you ever got a podcast or a radio show called uh, Lake Will Be Gone. It was Garrison Keillor. Oh, it was so good. good. It was good. a variety show, but the highlight of it is when Garrison Keillor with his amazing voice would just stand up and say, now the news from Lake Will Be Gone, my hometown. And it was always this incredible, all, all made up, by the way, all yeah. made up. Yeah. But then he would just tell these incredible magic realist stories of the people that lived there. So these short stories are kind of like Lake Will Be Gone with mm-hmm. monsters. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's a great, I mean, it's kind of how Hemingway started his career was with short stories and, and trying to just get things off the top of his head. I mean, I remember reading about Hemingway and how at one point he went to Paris and he was a man at the time who wanted Instagram in his life, but he had a feast at the point where he was invited to a, a, a kind of collection of writers, but he wrote a, small, a, a collection of short stories about the food he was eating. Um, and that was some of the first things he wrote so like yeah short stories are a great form of just 
getting those short form things out of your head onto paper. Um, yeah. And like yeah. and, and a good form in themselves, yes. right? I uh, love that it, uh, it's either useful or you get rid of it. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, and you can't look like you're just being functional with that. So it's a great magic trick. No, um, I've always loved short stories. I grew up on Ray Bradbury short stories, and he, you know, when people ask, so which artist influenced you the most growing mm-hmm. up? Well, it's Ray Bradbury. Yeah. 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 It, was, it wasn't. It wasn't like a, a an artist painter or illustrator right. it was a writer yeah. because he'd fill my head with so many images that i ran screaming to a piece of paper to draw them down before my head blew up yeah i mean it's i think that the most famous short stories is something like is it isn't it ten thousand nights is that the one that's like the most oh uh, the uh, the arabian nights yeah, yeah basically the, the woman who so the sultan if anyone doesn't know the story it's a really great story but the sultan yes. who was cheated on by his wife so he cut her head off but then Every night he would sleep with a different woman, but then would cut their head off in the morning. So the woman that eventually came to tell the stories, he, she would tell the story um, during the night and then would leave him on a cliffhanger um, for the next day to finish the story. So he, he was like, oh, I can't cut her head off because, you know, she oh. has to tell me the end of the story. And that was where the 10,000 Arabian night stories came from, which included things like Aladdin. Thousand, thousand and one. Thousand, thousand and one. one yeah. yeah. So it was a long time. Yeah. But yeah. you know, for what it's worth, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story called The Thousand and Second. Yes, night. I've read it. Yep, yep. Yeah, and it's yep. great because yes. it's the one story where she went too far. She <laughs> <laughs> chopped her head off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even even one. I think it was. I don't think it was Hemingway, but it was a short story I read not too long ago called "The Yellow Wallpaper," and it was about yeah. the the history of hysteria with women and stuff like that as well, and mental asylums. But yeah, short stories are a great form factor, and, and and you know, I think that's why you can relate that stuff to concept art because every concept art piece of art you look at is a is a short story in itself. You're trying to tell the shortest possible story to convey the most information. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and I and I do aspire to write novels one day. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's short stories aren't even building blocks to novels. They're they're an art form that I love in itself. And if I just wrote those for the rest of my life, I'd be happy. Yeah. But I I have some stories that have to be told in a longer form. Yeah. And I know that's going to be a whole new learning curve. Yes. How do you, how do you sustain this? I, actually, you know, Shadowline's a, a novella. So I guess I've, I'm like halfway between a short Adventure story. And, yeah. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I don't think it's something that you would struggle with or, or would be lost. Oh, initially. yes, I will. I <laughs> promise I will. <laughs> I don't think, I mean, I don't know, Ian, well, possibly, yeah, but yeah. Um, I mean, I've always, I've felt I've always been better with the pen and the pencil. That's always been things that I found that, like, even with my talking, like, I found that because I'm sometimes so articulate with the way I speak to people in general when it comes to writing, I can transfer that articulation into that medium as well. So my early career was writing video games reviews before I thought I wanted to work in the industry. So um, art was the one I thought, you know, I also enjoy being creative in art. So I would, I would try and collaborate the two. But yeah, I've always loved writing. And we've talked about the, a short story that I'm writing as well at the moment. And, you know, it's, that's definitely coming more natural to me than the, than the art stuff I think it comes but then I think it's just because I have been so obsessed with stories all my life watching films isn't and TV that, yeah. isn't it funny that that got put off so you could do the art yeah, I know right? <laughs> it's funny uh, that way but, no but I, I think I understand why I think because you you have a natural gift for words mm-hmm. but a great love for art yes art was the one that took more work mm-hmm. so obviously it must be more worthy because yeah. it's harder so, because yep. I was the, I was the same. I mean, I, I do love words, mm-hmm. and I've written even longer. Well, just as long as I've ever drawn since I was about four years old. I was writing crazy. Right. I think my first story was six years old. It was the island of what, okay. and just a, I drew a map, and then it was some get poor guy that got stranded on this island and had to find his way off. And I think he starved for a month until my dad said, "No, if anybody doesn't eat for a month, they die." Yeah. So I, I learned about, okay, you better do some research here it's yeah. at six, right? Yeah. To make it more real. And, but, but the writing was always like, had to learn stuff. Mm-hmm. Whereas the drawing just seemed to come naturally. So obviously I was going to be a writer you know, all, my whole life. I didn't take art in, in school really when I was younger. I took it in my last year when I moved to Scotland. Right. Uh, and I impl- applied to universities to, you know, to be a writer and mm-hmm. an art school. And I got into the art school. Wow. So th- that's how my career kind of did that. Yeah. But you never lose, you never lose the other side. It's just that, I don't know, in some ways I, I had to unlearn a lot of stuff I thought I'd learned when I was trying to be a writer. Right. I remember yeah. I have a great, great bunch of writer friends, but one was such a muse to me, uh, Terry Windling. 
Um, she's a fantastic writer, she's mm. an amazing editor. And I remember once when she came over, we we're collaborating on one of her stories. I wanted to turn that into a film. Mm -hmm. And um, I said to her, God, I would give anything to write stories. Mm. And she said, that's why you can't. Because <laughs> if you want it that bad, yeah. you're not writing. You're just sitting there hoping, 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 and hoping every word is going to be great. Mm -hmm. I've never forgotten that. And now I, I, I don't actually care. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. want to tell the story. I don't care you know, whether I can or can't do it. That doesn't really matter. It's the same with drawing. Yeah. Whether I can or can't draw something, you just say nevertheless, and you draw it anyway, because you have to. I mean, if you want to do something, you will just do it. I mean, there's a really just good thing and it's, it's, it's the weirdest reference but it's from sister act two when oh, yeah. whoopi goldberg is talking to lauren hill and she's talking about this book called i think it's letters to a young poet and he says you know I, I want to be a writer i love writing can you read my stories and he was like i don't have to read your stories to tell you you're a writer if you wake up and the first thing you want to do is write you're meant to be a writer and it's the same yeah, 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 yeah. singing so yeah it's so, so true yeah such a good quote but, no um, and and people people often ask like how do i know if i'm good enough right mm. would you look at my profile go tell me if i'm good enough i said it's easy it's easy i don't have to look yeah. just go home and stop drawing right mm. and if and if the pain of not drawing is greater than the pain of drawing you've got what it takes go back and draw yeah 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 i mean there's people i know who are maybe at the higher echelons but they, i know they speak about how if they haven't drawn during the day, if they've been busy or something, they will get a, a kind of itch. Yeah, it's like at the back of their head, like I need to, I need to. You're a terrible person, no, you got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also if you don't keep doing it every day for fun, right, for the joy of doing it. Yes. Um, it they say like the, the day after you start to notice, mm -hmm. right? And then the day after that, your characters, whoever you're drawing starts mm -hmm. to notice too. And mm -hmm. the third day the audience starts to notice and then you're in trouble, yeah. right? Um, yeah, but that, that comes back to some things I wanted to say about AI, not that I want to go on about it because it's, no, no, it's, it's a new, yeah. new tool and it's growing and it's, you know, both exciting and terrifying mm -hmm. and all that stuff mm -hmm. and illegal and, but can't be made legal and just yep. all that sort of thing. But it's funny that there, we're making machines to replace work in the name of efficiency yep. when the work is actually what creates the art right mm -hmm. by getting in there and um coming up with ideas and knowing how to generate ideas out of nothing yep. by hitting a wall where you can't draw something and then learning how to do it mm -hmm. that that journey is what turns you into an artist. It's better to, to fail and have to figure it out than to have the answer every single time and just pour it out because you've done it before. Yeah. Right. If that happens, you're not stretching. You're not, you're not growing as an artist. So do stuff all the time that you can't do, but the work, the word work has become a bad word and work is the best of words. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just have to work joyfully. You have to, you have to embrace the work and love the feeling of work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I want a machine to replace the, what to me is the, the chocolate box of what I do. Yeah. I mean, it would be exactly like hiring somebody to eat your lunch for you and then describe how delicious it was. <laughs> I mean, AI in, in general is just, you know, I've seen the benefits of it in the sense that not the, the art related stuff. So stuff like chat GPT, which is the more just mm -hmm. virtual assistant I've seen where you know, one of my friends who's a, a personal fitness coach had used it to, to plot out some kind of several uh, weekly diets that it would, it would come up with, you know, and ingredients and recipes. And it saves him a bunch of time in that, in that aspect of his work. But um, yeah, the art stuff is, is the bit that's worrying because, yeah, it, I mean, it, it feels like people are kind of rushing to it just now to take advantage of it as quickly as they can. And, you know, you and I have talked about this before about Carla and the great work she's doing, you know, with, I mean, only recently I saw the small short um, Instagram reel where they'd all been in DC and spoke in Congress. So um, with Steven Zapata and all those guys as well. So like, it's great that people are fighting that our corner, but um, I think just because so much of it is unknown, but in my email the other day, I talked about how the thing I'm pursuing, I'm going to just throw in caution at the wind and almost saying, fuck AI, you know, like, it doesn't matter what's going to happen with it. You know, at the end of the day, the pursuit, pursuit of art is for me and not for always financial gain or for industry gain. It's just something I want to do. So as long as I keep that flame burning, you know, that will never really extinguish. And I can always move and adjust as I need to, you know, as things change. But 
Um, yeah, well, we'll all have to, we'll all have to do that, right? Yeah. We'll all have to adapt to this new thing that's not going to go away, and it's only going to grow and become more and more. Well, you were on the cusp of when uh, when John made Photoshop at ILM, you know. So I mean, like, yeah, absolutely. I was there when all that happened. That yeah. was really astounding, uh, and I still didn't have a computer on my desk for many years. I didn't have anything there for most of for all of episode one, yeah. and uh, it was only sometime during episode two after Dermot came over with his computer. <laughs> that I got interested in it and I didn't really use it until episode three. Yeah. I mean, even the first iterations so, of Photoshop, you couldn't, I mean, the, the Wacom tablets weren't even really a thing. It was still a mouse, you know? No. That, yeah. I've drawn with a mouse. I, I did the uh, 256 color portraits for <laughs> the secret of monkey Island with <laughs> a mouse, with a mouse. I knitted those colors. Yeah, yeah. It was really fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did you mean, you mentioned monkey Island? Yeah, I worked on The Secret of Monkey Island. Oh, I never knew. Oh, that's one thing I never knew about you. So I don't know if you can see my arm, but it's... Uh... Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know those guys, yeah. Well, they'd done the first version of it. Right. Whatever it was, 64 or 32 colors, whatever right, they right, had. Right. <clears throat> and then and then it, when I was... You know, I'd come to the States mm -hmm. from London uh -huh. um, to be a guest of honor at a science fiction convention. Right. And I've been an illustrator then for 10 years. Okay. Um, so, you know, I was sort of in my career. All I had to do was start writing the books too, and mm -hmm. yeah, I could die happy. Yeah. But um, uh, ILM were going around looking for artists. Oh, of at course, that Lucas Arts was part of it. Yeah, back then. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, it was Lucasfilm because ILM was looking too. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and I was illustrating Peter Pan at the time, and I think they liked my, my Peter Pan drawings, and they were going to do Hook. Right. So I got hired, but they weren't ready. Right. So I went to the games division mm -hmm. and I worked on this upgraded version of Secret of Monkey Island. Fantastic. <laughs> Suddenly 200 and was it 56 oh, colors or 64 yeah. colors? Wow. Oh, they couldn't believe they had so many colors on this thing called a computer that I'd never, I'd seen computers because my brother uh, was studying astro uh, physics okay. back wow. in university and you know computers i know those they fill rooms mm -hmm. and it's like no no here's a box now <laughs> it does what that <laughs> the big chunky motor yeah, yeah it was it was yeah, yeah. and you have to learn something called dos it's like <sighs> what's that that's you know, that's system. Yeah, yeah, back in the day i remember that i like well. languages so yeah. like, you know yeah. so overnight over a weekend i took it home and i just sweated away and mm. learned how to use it <laughs> and you're right there was no such thing as tablets yeah so i literally like it was mm. like knitting. Mm. If you do this and move the mouse at the same time, mm. you can make a line. Mm. And that was how I did my colors and stuff. Oh you can still see them. Just just Google Secret of Monkey Island, Ian McKay. Yeah. Wow. They'll turn up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, Tim, Tim Schaefer and Ron Gilbert are two of my, my kind of. Oh, heroes. yeah. Yeah. Of course. Love those guys. Tim's an old friend. Yeah, love yeah. him to pieces. Love, love. And, and Steve Purcell, who did a lot of the design yep. for Secret of Monkey Island. Yeah. That, yeah that, amazing guy. That initial He's back it. to the guys that worked at LucasArts back in the day who made stuff like Dig and. You know, full throttle. You know, mm. the technical. I worked on the big. Yeah, lots of those guys are still kind of going today, and Tim, Tim especially now because he has double fine, and <clears throat> so yeah. Um, and Monkey Island obviously recently was just really released as well, run on another version of it as well. So, um, yeah, it's good to see those guys still going. But yeah, I mean, like it's it's, it's weird. I don't I don't play computer games. Mm. I watch them. Yeah. Right. So when my kids were going through, I would I would watch them play because mm. if I'm playing so involved, I'm not seeing what's on the screen. Right. And really, I after either the story or the their experience mm. going through which is the story right yeah um but i've designed lots of them mm -hmm. for some reason it it just ran in parallel with designing for film and often the freedom you got in games was so much greater and what you drew was more often on the screen yeah in games than in film I mean, so interesting for me to talk to you even as an interviewee because like you know I, I do know about your film history and the things you've done at ILM and stuff like that, but less about the game side stuff you've worked on. And the... Oh, really? Oh, I designed a lot of James Bond games. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I was a big James Bond fan uh -huh. uh, as a kid. Yeah. I, I read the books, long, every one of them, right. at least three times, Wow. long before I ever went and saw a James Bond film. Fantastic. Um, and I've discovered now, by the way, uh, that it was the film noir aspect of it that appealed to me mm. about james bond yeah um because I, I know that ian fleming was a big raymond chandler fan okay and um really and, and the two of them ended up friends mm -hmm. as well um and it really was it was that that sort of dark seedy but very well observed life yeah right and, and chandler in particular mm -hmm. was such compassion for every character yeah. even even the 
nasty, nasty ones. They're still nasty, yeah. but you could see something of yourself in them always. And I just love, I love his writing. I've read yeah. everything he's written. I think it's mostly and, and, just, and, yeah, when you go in. Yeah. So Fleming, Fleming kind of took a riff off of that mm. and then added this secret agent character that was almost like a superhero. Yeah. And it just gave it this new flavor. Yeah. And that really appealed to me when I was growing up. So I really fell into that whole James Bond thing. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and then I saw the films mm -hmm. and I had drawn Sean Connery <sighs> since I was about 10 years old. Yeah. I had no idea what he sounded like. Uh, I knew he was Scottish. Yeah. So my dad approved. <laughs> um, I knew he had those like big side crinkles up there, yeah. and I wanted them so bad. I used to walk around with clothes pegs on my cheek, oh, yeah. trying to like get the line. I mean, my dad said you got that from kissing girls. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> but but I just there was something about his face mm -hmm. and something about his presence, yep. right? His way of standing and and so on. That I just kept drawing and drawing and drawing. Mm -hmm. And then when I finally saw him in a Bond mm -hmm. film, it wasn't until Diamonds Are Forever. Oh, wow. So I'd already seen George Lazenby yep. as James Bond. And, and in a great story, too, mm -hmm. Under Majesty's Secret Service is one of the best of the Bond stories. Mm -hmm. um, it is. It's amazing. And in the books, even better. Yeah. Even better because it's the beginning of a trilogy mm -hmm. of stories that they didn't do in the films oh, that should have fit together. Because, yeah. come on, you kill Bond's wife? <laughs> you want to see what happens to him after that? Read the books. Yeah. So. Anyway, so I, I so so got into to that. Mm -hmm. Why was I telling you about James Bond? There was a reason. Hey, oh God, good question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. But I, I mean, I think it was, well, just, yeah. What inspires you, right? right? What 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 gets you going mm -hmm. and and uh, makes you want to be an artist is half the time just wanting to be part of the things you love. Yes. You know, when I say Star Wars, and your eyes light up. Oh yeah, of course. No, no, huge Star Wars. Right? They didn't. For me, it was you know I'd like Star Wars, but my Star Wars, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, desk, my Star Wars yeah. was, was James Bond right. and and Dune. Right, that book Dune, man, changed my life. How, how, so what, was the, what was the view of the the Dune, the latest film? Then, what was your opinion on it? Um, yeah, is it long, complicated? When you, fall in, yeah. when you fall in love with something like like a book, mm. especially yeah. where. Now, a book's a bunch of inert words, right. and until you bring your imagination to it and your images and mm. your experiences, mm. those words don't come to life. Right. So half of what I love about Dune is that it was my imagination. Right. It was me. It was me supplying that stuff yeah, with Frank about, Herbert. Yeah. So when I see the film, it's usually um, less because it's not what I would have made. Yeah. Nothing's ever going to live up to but, your expectation. But I can forgive it. I can yeah, but I can I can forgive it if the heart of it's right. Yes. So Ian McKellen isn't exactly how I imagine Gandalf, mm -hmm. but he's Gandalf. Yeah. He's 100% Gandalf because yeah. he caught the heart of Gandalf exactly right. Yes. So for me, in the film, they, they did a really good attempt at capturing the heart of many things. Mm -hmm. What they missed was the, <clears throat> for me, mm -hmm. it was the sort of the philosophical, um, mystical, aspects of the book and and a humor that's also in those books too um a lot of the characters it's sort of an absurdist humor yeah right? it was very dark well, yeah. it was very dark and very and little 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 depressing sometimes i was waiting for something to light up and also for me as a storyteller the heart of dune is it's the story of a kid who can see the future mm. and not just the future, but every future, right? Right. Every time he takes a step, mm -hmm. the future changes. Right. And in every one of those futures, mm -hmm. he is responsible for the death of billions of people. <laughs> so he's struggling for the whole damn book yeah. to try to not let, to find a future, a step he can take yep. that will lead to not killing those people. Yeah. And finally, and spoilers now for the rest of the story, <laughs> when he realizes he will never be able to change that, he goes, screw it. Yeah. And he embraces it and he lets it happen. And it's it's those books that come after are the consequences of that decision. Yeah. And I love that. I love the simplicity of that. And it always seems to me that they take Dune and they take the heart of it and leave it in the hotel room and then go off and make a movie <laughs> about everything else. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping, but it looked beautiful. Yeah, I, it was great, and the actors were doing a good job with those characters. Yeah. So there's so much to praise, and I can't wait for the third one. Yeah, 
I mean, the, the second one, the second one's just been announced, right? The the, the the second part has just been. Sure, I can't wait for the second yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. So that will be interesting to see where they go with the trilogy. But yeah, I mean, like the, the, I have been told, the director has been, you know, kind of praised that he's done a really good job of interpreting the books. But like you say, that's never. I mean, I grew up on uh, Terry Pratchett, and a lot of times when I watched any Discworld interpretations, then um, yeah, it's always different in my head than how it was on screen and. Um, yeah. you know, so yeah, I mean, I think you get a. I think that's also because that's why kind of influenced me early on was a lot of that. You know, it was either Monty Python or Terry Pratchett I was reading. So the comedy aspect of stuff like Monkey Island was what appealed to me because of the writing. So, um, but yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah, I mean, I get where you come from. Like, you, you're never going to have. I think even with Star Wars, we've talked about this previously as well, is that people will have a built up establishment of like what they wanted the latest films to be as well, but just people feel didn't hit the mark and. Yeah. It's it's a tough one, yeah. right? Especially without without the guy who created it there, kind of yeah. you know, shepherding or you know pointing the way. But fortunately, he did he did have an apprentice. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dave Filoni really did sit down and you know at the master's knee and and learn what he was trying to say, learn what he was trying to yes. do. And I, I think uh, the the Filoni and John Favreau, who's just an incredibly Amazing. I think his back's getting tired Actually. carrying so many franchises on his back. He's just, he's just... Oh, but he's a he's a he's a good guy. Oh, yeah, he's of a course. Good no, no, I've heard very good things about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that combination mm -hmm. worked really, really well in that first season of The Mandalorian. Oh, yeah. And I haven't seen the other two, and I, you know, I hear all kinds of things, yeah. but that first one was great. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, along comes Andor. Yeah, and Andor is incredible. Yes. And Andor is a brand new take on on star wars i remember when i worked on the series i kept saying can we see what they're fighting for please <laughs> just once why is it a so rebellion? Always it rebellion all about yeah yeah exactly can we see what it is and they kept saying it's star wars not star peace oh, yeah. yeah yeah but then but then andor did yeah. it did it in a very clever way it said okay well instead then let's see what it's like for the ordinary person let's get rid of the superheroes yeah the, fighting the war the skywalker saga thing has been also you know i think done to death at this point with luke and stuff and i think it's like you said a lot like even when rogue one came out you know people really praised that film because i think it took a step away again from the main track and mandalorian also to an extent had done that and branched out and why well, i think clone wars had got so I much attention you, you know yeah, they, they love the Star Wars universe, but I, I don't think people keep, they don't keep wanting the same story. They they want it to go somewhere, take them somewhere. Um, and But, you know, you saw what happened when George did that. If you step in a different direction and they don't like it, of course, it, it can cause a huge outcry too. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, but that's storytelling, yeah. right? That's entertainment. Uh, the, when you step on the stage, there is no guarantee the audience is going to clap. Yeah. And that's how it should be. Yeah always risk him yeah. and that's that's the um conundrum yeah. of the film industry yeah because it's a lot of money mm -hmm. for these really big shows yeah. and so they try to mitigate the risk by getting things they think will guarantee success yeah. well guess what <laughs> nothing guarantees success there is nothing yeah. not any name actor not any great screenwriter nothing not the greatest director in the world can't guarantee that film's going to be a success I right. think as long as you, and that's how yeah i think as long as you tell an honest story i mean i think like i've talked about this in the past where the obi-wan series which is mostly meant to be a film i felt was really incredible and i felt i'd done a really good storytelling aspect of it a really true like the line where you know anakin eventually says to obi-wan you didn't kill anakin skywalker i did you know like chills run through yeah. my body i was like oh my god like you know and you know yoon's obviously in tears and oh my god my friend's dead um but i felt that was one of the more honest star wars things we had seen you know as well and you and, yeah. and hayden have talked yeah. about that in interviews where they said you know the people who watched the prequels who were kids at the time are now growing up and saying that was my star wars you know it was a great you know a bit we all know back at the time the prequels were met were such you know like oh my god i can't believe and you know so crazy. and now yeah they look back fondly so yeah it's, it's crazy how the yeah time 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 changes things, yeah. and that's important to remember yeah. too, right? That's what I'm saying. It'd, it'd be interesting to see if the the late Star Wars films age well into the future. Like if they will then be ten years from now seen differently. So well, stick stick around, my friend. You'll find out. <laughs> I mean, I I grew up actually. I did have some science fiction films back then. They weren't they weren't all. Um, uh, it wasn't a good genre. It was a very hard thing to sell when George was out trying to uh, get his series yep. made, uh, his one show mm -hmm. made. Um, 
But we did have Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. We did have that series. Mm -hmm. And especially those first two shows in the original Planet of the Apes were amazing. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I I think you just love what you love. You can cherish it all your life and you can find meaning in the most worthless of things as far as you know literature goes or as far as some sort of value uh ultimate value goes if it has value for you if it inspired you and gave you a rock to lean on and a moral center or something yep. superman was always my guy mm-hmm. you know growing up i think i was three or four when my dad got me a subscription to superman comics so i grew up, i grew up on that yep. guy and i still superman is just the ultimate character to me and i know the world's divided into superman people and batman people <laughs> and carlos and batman people so we have this discussion often yeah. but i like superman because he's this um unstoppable force right he's, mm-hmm. he's come to earth and he's got all these powers and stuff to do what exactly mm-hmm. he wants to help and protect the planet but how do you make people be good yeah I mean, you can stand in front of the bullets so they don't shoot each other, but the moment you step away, they're going to shoot each yeah. other again. Um, you know what I mean? And and so do you make them be good? They they did a really good um, story about Superman. If, if he had come just seconds later and the world had turned and he landed oh, Russia. in Russia. Red sun. Yeah. yeah. Red yeah. sun, right? And it's like, yes, the moment he made them act a certain way, he's not Superman anymore. He's he's different kind of yeah. character, and not one that I loved. Yeah. So, you, you know... Um, uh, I found meaning in Superman yep. because he had to walk that horrible line of how do you help something and not control it? And years later, of course, I discovered it's exactly the same as being a parent, mm-hmm. right? It's exactly the same as trying to have a yeah. life too. You, you know, you, you can't control everything. Yeah. You have to allow things to happen. You have to allow yourself to make mistakes. You have to allow people you love to make mistakes. Yeah. Just watch them like hawks and be there when they need you. Yeah. I've, I've, right. Which is what I think Superman gets. also sets an example of being better than everyone in a sense that no better than that he thinks, but that he sets an example of how, what it is to be a good person and tries to then emulate that through his team in the justice league and other people and see that like you know we don't have to kill people to change them you know we can be gentle we can be the better person the bigger person and um right. yeah what is batman i think what, goes, just yeah. it's what dc's fumbling the ball on right oh, now yeah. no no offense yeah. they're working hard but come on i mean james gunn hopefully now will take the mantle and run with it i'm um, fingers crossed but we'll see what happens fingers crossed yeah, yeah we'll yeah. see because even john but again that's, yeah i was just gonna that's my superman right? that's superman that i've got in yeah. my heart and soul and and it doesn't mean that it's even the one that really exists. It's just the one that I fell in love with. The same with James yeah. Bond too. You know, James Bond really stands for a lot of things that I'm absolutely against. <laughs> you know, the way he treats women is it's just no, of awful. Course. Yeah, yeah. Um, but my James Bond did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a fan of uh, Daniel Craig's run of it as well. Did you find his? Oh, yeah. of course. Well, not the run, but uh, Casino Royale. Right. Okay. Absolute. That that is despite my absolute love of Sean yeah. Connery, um, that is the best Bond film is Kissing Royale. I, I, I believe and, that's and, true. Yeah, I do think that's very accurate. Yeah, I did think that. Well, for yeah. me, for me, because it actually was the only one that actually kind of reflected the book. It's a different time period than the right. book. But the raw film noir grittiness of it all was absolutely that story. Plus, when you've got a character that is a just constant character in a storyline, they really don't change a lot. The world changes around them, and it's it, the question is really: Can it change this person? Can it do anything to them? And the answer is no. They are who they are. But Bond was changed twice in the series of books. He was changed in the first mm-hmm. one when um, he almost went in a different direction, and then that got shut down by what mm-hmm. happened. And he says his line: "You know, I think uh, they let him know that the girl is is dead. And, you know, sorry, they they let him know that the girl was going to betray him and all that. And he goes, yes, the bitch is dead." And you go, wait, no, two pages before you were madly in love with her. What did you just do? And you realize James Bond has just died. Yeah. And for the rest of, of the series, practically, you've got this man who's not alive mm-hmm. protecting everyone else who yeah. is. And then in Honor Majesty Secret Service, somebody breaks through mm-hmm. and wins his heart and he marries yeah. her. And then she gets killed. <laughs> and then he gets yeah. shot at the end. But rather than become dead mm-hmm. again, Bond becomes a vendetta machine and the next two stories and in the books it's you only live mm-hmm. twice and the man with the golden okay. gun 
Vaughn goes on this crazy journey of revenge against Blofeld and strangles him in the end um, with his bare hands mm-hmm. in this, in, having traversed this garden of death, mm. which they sort of butchered and stole from one of the films, but he's like dying himself mm. and he barely manages to, to mm. escape. But when he comes to, he's lost his memory mm. and the cover, the girl who was like of the little village that was supposedly giving him his cover had fallen in love with him and told him, well, you're my husband. She never said anything about being a secret mm. agent. And for years he lives on this little Island with this woman and has no idea who he is. And, then one day, I think on a, on a piece of newspaper, he sees the word uh, smersh, which was the Russian secret service that Ian right, Fleming yeah. used. I don't think it was Spectre. Yeah. And he goes, oh, I think I come from here. So he goes to Russia. Yeah. And in, in The Man with the Golden mm-hmm. Gun, he's been gone for a long yeah. time. And suddenly he appears in M's office and M's like, what the hell, Bond? And Bond pulls out a gun and shoots him. <laughs> Unfortunately, M survives mm-hmm. it, but then it's like, well, what do you do with this damaged agent? So the man with the golden gun was the story of the redemption of James I mean, Bond. So you see yeah. what I mean? That they tie it up so beautifully like puzzle pieces. You can't chop them up. I know. It's, it's difficult because I'm thinking about spe- how Spectre, the kind of last one, was about him kind of coming back from being shot. And yeah, right. and so, yeah, right. like... Well, they did try. Yeah, yeah, I think they've tried to. Because I think it, when, when Ian had died, I think his son had taken over in a sense he was going to work with the film team to try and integrate the stuff in so but again you wouldn't have it's like not having george there right you're not you don't have the original source so you're struggling to piece stuff together or make it feel coerced so um yeah yeah i mean but yeah but i mean bond, i think daniel craig's run was definitely one of the better ones considering other bonds that had oh, come for, and been, for sure so, for sure um, but it's interesting as well with with superman like it's a thing where I've now kind of grown up, no grown up, but like Cavill's been such a huge part of that franchise for so long now. And it's hard to think who would replace, even when he'd done The Witcher for three seasons and now he's left, it's like, I don't know if I can see anybody else doing that role. And for Superman, especially, it's difficult. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But but a fun challenge, right? Fun to try and find a person who can embody that and find a direction for you, Superman. But that, see, that's what makes a reboot um powerful yeah. may, it may not work but it makes it powerful it's when you grew up with mm-hmm. something you loved mm-hmm. it and then over the years you see that people seem to have lost the thing you mm-hmm. loved so if you get a chance to come back and be in charge of that character you bring that thing you think people have forgotten yeah. that may have only been in your yeah. head right and you embody that in the yeah. character i mean I, I, but I think to be fair i think that's what Zack snyder tried to do i just i didn't like the superman that was in his head yeah like i mean <clears throat> for me with matt reeves like you know with the fact that the batman came out with robert pratson i mean i've been a lifelong batman fan all my life and i think <clears throat> his interpretation of the batman is one of the best i think it was a great film um although i have met people who have said the story was boring it was too dark you know it focused too much on the detective stuff so Still yeah i mean definitely one to, i mean even if you're not a fan of the batman films or the batman character i think it's just a really well executed story oh, no, I love oh yeah, yeah. yeah i love batman i you know there's no such thing as whether batman's in, or is better than oh, superman yeah. because <laughs> no because in the mm-hmm. comics you know they're they're very different in their yes. outlooks but they're best yes. friends the best friend, they have a comic together called the world's yeah, finest yeah, yeah. You know, Dark Knight put them at odds with each other, and everybody took that note and ran with it. But no, yeah. guys. I mean, I I grew up with the, it's a yeah, I grew up with the cartoons early on, and, and you know, my, my childhood. But even in Justice League, there's a time when they think Superman is dead and gone, and outside of all the the, the looking from you know, Bruce comes to the statue of him that they erect, and he talks for like five minutes about you were the best of us, and I've always respected you, and I thought you were great, and. You know, like you were better than me yeah. and everything, and I deserve to that. It should have been me. So, like, yeah, I've always seen that dichotomy between the two of them. They've always got a mutual respect that runs really deep. So, um, yeah. But it, isn't it funny? Because you know, we wondered what we were going to talk about. We end up talking about Superman and James <laughs> Bond and, <laughs> and stuff. But but they are they are um, they are stories that embody qualities yes. that are well, very. Storytelling is what we're kind of talking about in general. Is that just yeah? Well, but those particular yes. stories they embody certain heroic aspects yep. that i think you matter to yep. you and i right right it matters to me that we don't 
fight with yes. each other that we find ways to to help and 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 I see it. Mm -hmm. I see it a lot. It's not reported in the news because it's not as sexy as as yeah. violence. We take there's a lot more mileage out of people fighting, it seems, than people getting along being good to each yes. other. But I think that's laziness, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um it's just harder to portray powerful yes. good. But powerful good is stronger than powerful yeah. evil. You, you just have to do the work. It's back to that word work again. Yeah. If you don't really work at how to show powerful good, and if you, you can't cheat and make evil yeah. less, you actually have to find good that's more powerful. Um, you can. But even Dore, you know, the amazing Dore when he was doing the um, – you know, Paradise Lost, and, and he's showing Dante's yep. Inferno, and he's going down into the seven hell. levels yep. of hell. And it looks great because everybody's naked and they're all <laughs> roiling around, having like a tormented hey. good time. And then you go up to heaven, and everybody's wearing these long mm -hmm. white gowns, and they're just sitting like this, playing their harps. You could tell they're bored out of their minds. <laughs> and, and I used to think, no, that's yeah. wrong. That's good has to be more powerful. How you have to find ways to show that. But good is a. Good is a thing that usually has to have a context. You know, evil is just good with corruption, yep. right? But but so it's so easy, so easy to just destroy something that's mm. perfect. But to show something that's actually good, it's an action. It's a thing you do. It's a moment. There's no such constant state as good. It's a thing you have to strive for every single mm -hmm. second, and that's harder to show. But for some reason, we think that because it because horns and spikes and black and all that sort of stuff is usually used mm -hmm. for evil. You can't use it for good. Of course you can. You can use it for anything. Good can have yeah. anything. And that's why anti-heroes are so popular, yeah. right? Well, I mean, because there's a nice combination of good. I saw someone evil. talking about, in a, in a discussion of storytelling, about how heroes and villains essentially have the same story arc, that the, both their past contain painful memories or pain in general. And if you think about, even anti-hero and it's an essential i think batman essentially a kind of anti-hero but like him and clark are both orphans but they've went about <clears throat> crime fighting or taking things completely differently than the way they approach it so it's like you know batman has a thing where you know he will beat people to a bloody pulp and get to that point where he almost kills people but he doesn't really but then clark also just tries to you know you know has a lot of power but tries to not use as much of it and so like they're, they're, you can come from the same origin but have different vastly different ways of looking at um how you deal with grief like batman has a really good story a few years ago i've read about it's called i think it was based on flashpoint but it's where um instead of his mom and dad dying bruce dies and then his mom becomes the joker his dad becomes batman but his dad actually uses guns as opposed to just punching people so to grieve they both lose their son but they grieve in different ways so his mom becomes a villain his dad becomes the hero um yeah like red sun like a different twist on the story so yeah just a, yeah, Rushman did the mm -hmm. same thing, right? Uh, three different perspectives on exactly the yes. same event, and you come away with a, a bigger picture view at the end than you did with just the one single story. Yeah. Some of these yeah. stories have always been incredible, especially some stuff like I read about Superman back in the day, where it was an arc where he flew too close to the sun and then develops cancer and actually becomes vulnerable oh, wow. and, 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 and is, is dying. So, and it's like him trying to start and talking about his mortality, even though he's lived for so long. As, it's a mortal alien. So yeah, storytelling can be very powerful in that sense. But that's back to that same thing too of, of you know, you said they come, they have painful memories mm. in their past that sort of forged them into yep. what they are today. You don't need to have painful <laughs> memories. <laughs> no, yeah. really. Good stuff can yes. happen to you and form you into the person yeah. you are too. And, and we mustn't forget that or uh, become so lazy that we don't know how to show right. that, right? Like I say, par powerful good is incredible, but you just have to work to know how to make that. That's why in, in Star Wars, for me, you know, when I look back on what I did in episode one, if Darth Maul caught the air and, and lifted up, because like I say, people are just attracted to to dark and, and uh, yep. scary things. Um, Pad Padme was the reason I did that mm. show. Right. Padme was the the score right. for me, and and to some extent, um, you know, Qui Gon and and Obi Wan as well. I wanted a force that was strong, powerful, but not controlling, and um, embody that inside a character. And she hundred percent did that for me. I mean, yeah. So I mean, George yeah. talked about that as well, and on that you said that <clears throat> he sees the Jedi and stuff as essentially selfish and unselfish people. So people who think about more than just themselves, and people who only think about themselves. So it's a thing where. 
when you break it down to that level of storytelling, yeah, there's always a choice within yourself to be selfish or selfless. And it's, it's how you choose right. to interact with the world and how you tell that story as well. And, and that's, that's what I mean when you look at the news, yeah. what sells is the, is the terrible events yeah. and all the rest, but we maybe need to work a little harder at portraying the stuff that is happening. That is amazing mm -hmm. right now. People are out there <clears throat> cleaning the yeah. oceans, creating things that will actually eat plastic yeah. and you know, all kinds of, of stuff. And right now we have our own comic book level existential <laughs> crisis. If we don't re reset mm -hmm. the planet so that it can be sustainable and we can live sustainably on it. The human race is not going to be yeah. here anymore. It's just as yeah. simple as that. And we have the smarts, we have the compassion, we have everything, all the tools we need right now to be able yes. to do that. And, and I would hope to create stories and I hope people tell news about our heroic efforts to bang together instead of trying to smash each other with with every horrible weapon of mass destruction yes. that we have you know if if mm -hmm. we don't i don't see the point in winning mm -hmm. your war right why why you're not going to be mm -hmm. here anymore if we don't all of us pay a hundred percent attention to this right now um and it's a great chance i mean you saw that during the mm -hmm. pandemic too to suddenly realize that no you know everybody's a hero all those people that kept working and kept us going during those times while the rest of us reaped the benefits of that stuff, the people we took total, totally for granted and paid like the worst salaries on the planet, um, stepped forward and they all showed what a real superhero is. And, and so, yeah, now's our chance to be superheroes. Let's do it. <laughs> Please. More, more, more. And, and that's kind of where I want to dedicate like my life now a lot of my stories talk about that stuff, not yeah. directly, because as you know, if you dress it up in wings and horns yeah. and superpowers, uh, people don't get offended right away, and you can sneak in and talk to them about really important things. That I way. think it's more, I like to say um, again, more selfless, less selfish. I think is the idea we need to put into the world. So yeah, well, a lot, of, a lot of people who, a lot of uh, mm -hmm. artists, not just students, will write me and and suffer from really strong mm -hmm. depressions. And I know a lot of that's chemical and it's very hard to get out of that without any yeah. kind of chemical help. But um, for, for most people who aren't, um, who, who are really just suffering from, I don't know, mm -hmm. lack of work or a, um, a, a giant block that they can't get past or um, this feeling of, of having given all of your superpowers yeah. to someone else, you know, why did I even want to do this wonderful yeah. job? Because I'm not feeling fulfilled yeah. anymore. And the answer is, number one, today, go and do something really, really nice for somebody yeah. else. And don't tell anybody about it. Because then you're not doing yes. it for praise. And you're just, you're just doing it to, because that's the right yes. thing to do. And number two, go and do something for yourself. Fine. If you're an artist and you've always wanted to be a concept artist of such and such, or you always wanted to write a Star Wars story, or always wanted to do this, yeah. go do it. Yeah. Go do it. Find, make that time a priority because you're giving that gift to that kid that yeah. you used to be, that you promised was going to have a great life when they grew up. Yeah. Well, give it to them. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then that'll yeah, reset definitely. it. I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the time also because, you know, you're a busy man. I want to like, get back to your work. But um... <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I know, I know. Me too, me too. I'm lost in conversation. I could do this for hours. Um, if we were to sign off, if we were to kind of close the conversation, as you're kind of extending what you said there, what would be your advice to people watching this who are maybe depressed or are fearing AI or have a, a thing about what the future holds? What would be the kind of thing you would say to them if they were in front of you, kind of thing? Yeah, I would say if, if there's something you've always wanted to do, do it. And if you can't do it, do it anyway. Yeah, 100%. I agree with that. Well, like that, Ian, an hour has passed. How quickly it has went. Um, I feel like... That is amazing. Yeah. Yes. Thank you wow. Well, we should do this again sometime because you're a damn good <laughs> podcaster, my friend. I try. And I take that as a very big compliment. So thank you for saying that. Um, yeah. It's one of these things where, like, you know, I'd love to get people in multiple times and talk multiple times about different subjects. And, um, you know, it's just always one of these things where, you know, yourself, you, you're always busy. There's something on, you know, you're trying to carve time out to, to do stuff. But, 
um yeah maybe we'll try and um because uh for the audience uh benefit i am coming out to lightbox in la this year um e wow, yeah so ian nice. will be there as well and, and we'll maybe maybe try and get one in person and we'll see how it goes um but uh but yeah yeah if anybody's going to be there you can check me out and say hi and whatever else but it was funny the last time i went in 2019 people kept talking to me and they kept going i recognize your voice right i don't know where i've known your voice but i recognize your voice i'm like oh yeah do a podcast like oh listen i listen to i know your podcast so um yeah i've, I've always loved that yeah and and you know we're lucky sometimes to find out the uh, effect that our actions yep. do have on people right so yeah do, do good things yeah. good stuff I'm glad to watch some um yeah well again thanks dean for coming on it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you um we'll definitely try and get something else penciled in if we can and do another episode at one point and uh yeah thanks again for people who have came back after the little hiatus they've had and listened to the, the episode um i hope you enjoyed it um it will be you know one of the few ones i'm doing this year but again it was one of these things where i couldn't pass up the, the opportunity to talk to Ian, and i think it was well worth it um if you have any questions for Ian, i'm sure you can leave them down below um and i'll try and maybe leave some details if, if you want to get in contact with them and yeah that's really just it um thanks to you guys for listening thanks to you for coming on and uh hope whatever you guys are in the world you're staying safe and creative and uh, we'll see you guys in the next episode thanks guys Bye. Bye. cheers bye